Hello, I'm Rachel Siegel, the Executive Director of the Primavera Fund, and I would like to welcome you to our Sterling Masterclass online series. We've had to go online in response to the COVID-19 crisis, but we're very excited to be able to bring you this content in your homes every single week. So please check back for a new video on a new topic every Thursday at 4, and stay safe. Hi, I'm Damari McGill, and I'm the principal flutist of the Seattle Symphony and associate professor of flute at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. I'm so happy that I have the opportunity to speak with you. The path to becoming a musician is one that should be embraced and, and even accepted as a wonderful but never-ending pursuit. One reason this is the case is better understood if we simply change the name of this path of becoming a musician to, for instance, the path of efficient, joyful, and healthy progress. This is perhaps the reason why so many young musicians will discover that the tools they learn while growing as a musician are also useful and valuable in any field, specifically goal setting, discipline, problem solving, training not just your fingers, but also your mind to perform well under pressure. And if you're lucky enough to understand this intuitively, or are fortunate enough to have a teacher who emphasized the importance of this, perhaps the most useful ability or tool we have is the ability to inject life and beauty not only into our music, but hopefully anything and everything we aspire to do. So this is what I would love to focus on today. I'll talk about ways to use this beauty and whatever that means for you to inspire more efficient and rewarding progress. Whether we're spending 30 minutes in the practice room or six hours, we should all have a very clear idea of what we need to accomplish. This increases the likelihood that we'll actually accomplish something during a practice session. So understandably, our focus is usually on learning the music or, or more honestly, like simply learning the notes. And this makes total sense, since how can you play the music if you can't play the notes? So what usually happens is that we spend hours and hours, countless days, weeks, and even months trying to learn the notes and even try not to mess up. So let's say that eventually we get to the point where we're about to perform this piece of music we spent so much time working on. If we've been thorough, we've played many times for our teacher and even for our family members, or anyone who would listen. So today is the day that you're finally going to play this in front of an audience or a jury at a competition or a committee at an audition. So you walk out on stage or into the room and you stand there about to play this music you spent you know, so much time trying to learn. Best case scenario is that you actually play all the notes. You feel completely relieved and any audience will understand or even feel your goal to play all the notes or to get through the piece without making any mistakes so they also feel relieved. You then walk out of the room or off the stage and since you accomplish your goal, if this is a performance, you feel great. And maybe the next day you begin the process again with a different piece that also takes what seems like forever to learn, and you just repeat this process over and over again. If this performance was for a competition or an audition, you simply cross your fingers and hope that maybe the other competitors didn't play all of the, all of the notes or didn't get through their music perfectly. And you believe that if that happens, you should win the competition. But I would like to share with you my belief that even in these ideal scenarios, when you've actually accomplished your goal, the result is like winning a game of Uno. It feels really good to win, but how can you be sure you won because of skill or because you simply got lucky with a good hand of cards? I don't believe this is very satisfying as a musician or a performer. You know, if you're constantly having to cross your fingers and hope for the best, it also doesn't create an environment that promotes real growth and consistent development and progress. I would like for you to imagine a world in which getting through the piece and playing all of the notes are not your end goals. They are simply things that need to happen in order for you to reach your true goal of playing beautifully and expressively in a way that can inspire beautiful, sincere feelings in the listener. This means that, of course, we have to know the music we're performing, in order for us to be able to convey whatever mood needs to be showcased. 
And all of this serves the purpose of moving and inspiring the listener and even ourselves. So this is all easier said than done and actually requires practice just as you have to practice to learn the notes. So I want you to know that this practice needs to begin as soon as you pick up your instrument. For instance, when you're doing your warm-up, I would suggest not just thinking about developing better strength and flexibility with your sound if you're a wind player doing tone exercises, or not just thinking about accuracy and rhythmic precision when you're practicing technical exercises, but spending an equal amount of time while you're playing these other exercises, playing as beautifully as you can. You want to make playing beautifully a habit. Typically, we pick up our instruments and play an exercise, basically like a robot. We then begin playing an etude with the same lack of musical enthusiasm as the exercises. Then, of course, we can't expect to be any different when we begin working on a piece of music because we spent so many hours and hours training ourselves to remove the experience of making music when we're just simply focusing on our fingers. In essence, we spend more time music less than we do being musical. This creates a very interesting phenomenon of creating musicians who actually don't deeply feel they're making music. The best example of this is if you happen to listen to other genres of music. How does that music make you feel? Chances are great that that music has the power to make you want to dance, it makes you feel sad, happy, or inspired. Yet, when you pick up your instrument, these emotions have nothing to do with what you're trying to accomplish. Once again, we're just happy to play the notes. So what begins to happen when we change this perspective? What if while we're playing something, literally anything on our instrument, in addition to developing discipline and control over the instrument, we have as a goal to make the person in the next room feel something. This is something I did a lot when I was living with my parents prior to going to college. Even behind a closed door, I would try to play in a way that would inspire a response, hopefully a beautiful one. You know, either from my brother or my mother or my father. To be clear, the point was not to get them to say something to me. The practice, or this was a study and ultimately trying to make sure that my intent was clearly communicated through my music to someone. So much so that they could feel what I was trying to express via the flute and via the music, even if they're in another room. Something that needs to be addressed if we truly want to make playing beautifully a default setting in our playing is that we have to make sure that how we believe we sound is actually how we sound. It's quite possible to play through an entire work and feel as if it's the best thing ever. And maybe the listener is hearing and experiencing something completely different. I want to be really clear here. Because it's important to note that we should not live our musical existence trying to please everyone. This is not our goal. It should not be our goal. Our goal is just to make sure the gap between how we think we sound and how we actually sound is as small as possible. This is an important part to having efficient and productive practice sessions and is the only way to ensure consistent growth. This is because once we know how we honestly sound, and if we know how we want to sound, we can then do the necessary work to accomplish that goal, to getting us to where we want to be. This applies to our technical work, as well as our desire to communicate beautifully and clearly to an audience. Think about it this way. When you're speaking and you have something very important to say and express, if the listener doesn't understand your intentions or you're not communicating in a way that is easy for the listener to understand, the point of your message may be lost. So what can we do to incorporate beauty in our playing? Let's start with a basic technical exercise. There's an exercise of thirds that I like to do. I'll turn on the metronome and it's pretty easy to just focus on accuracy in the fingers and consistency in the sound. But what I also do in addition to these things is simply think about this exercise as a piece of music. This doesn't mean that I have to distort the rhythm or the pulse or do anything unusual with the sound. It just means that my intention is to play this exercise as beautiful as possible. <laughs> Just like I would approach these exact notes 
that they were part of a piece. So after going through a few exercises, I may then work on an etude. Since I've already been thinking about playing as well and as beautifully as possible, I don't need to make any mental or emotional adjustments when I approach these etudes or studies. In fact, I believe that etudes can really teach us how to make music. I mean that if you can take an etude and make it sound great and beautiful enough to perform on stage, you should then be more than equipped to work in a solo piece and bring it to performance level. I'll play just a little bit of the fifth etude by Jacques Castorade, and I'll emphasize again that although this is considered a study, I don't approach this any differently than I would a solo piece with piano. So finally, when we're ready to spend time with the solo repertoire, we don't have to treat it any differently than we treated the other necessary things we've been working on. Because at this point, we've not only warmed up our sound and our fingers, but we've also gotten used to injecting life and energy into every single note that we play. So it really isn't a huge leap to go from the castorate etude I just played to this work by Claude Debussy called Syrinx.
I hope all of you continue to have a wonderful and productive journey down your path of music making. And as you progress technically, make sure it's always within the context of making beautiful music that you and the listener can be moved by.